Well, welcome everybody. I'm Ben Schaberman, Senior Director of Scientific Outreach at the Foundation Fighting Blindness. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to our national chapter webinar on stem cells. Uh, we have a great lineup ahead and um, hundreds and hundreds of participants. So we're thrilled that so many of you could, could make it to this webinar. And it is the first day of spring. Happy spring to everybody. And I don't think we planned it this way, but um, spring is about renewal and regeneration. And that's what stem cells are about. So today happens to be a very apropos day to talk about stem cells. Just a quick review of our lineup. We're gonna have some introductory remarks from Martha Steele, our um, uh, chapter president in Boston. I'll have some introductory information on stem cells. Then we'll get to hear from our featured presenters, uh, our stem cell experts. And at the end, we'll have hopefully about a half hour for your questions. And you can enter those questions through the chat and the Q&A. We ask that you try to keep those focused on stem cells because that's where our expertise is for today. But to get things started, we have a special guest um, who has an exciting announcement to make. And our special guest is none other than Jason Menzo, the foundation's chief operating officer. So Jason, take it away. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Ben. And thank you everyone at home for joining us today. As Ben had mentioned, we've got a terrific lineup, three world-class experts in the area of stem cell research. Um, I also want to thank Martha Steele in our Boston chapter for hosting today's event. Um, but before we begin, I would like to take a few minutes and share something really special with you all. Some of you may know this, uh, but others may not. This past week marks the one year anniversary of the passing of one of our beloved co-founders, and that's Luli Gund. Luli was a very special force in the foundation. Not only was she a, a co-founder of the foundation itself, but she actually started one of our very first chapters in Princeton, New Jersey, almost 50 years ago. What you probably didn't know, however, is that not only did Luli begin that chapter, but in fact, she remained the chapter president for 48 years, right up until the time of her passing. And with this being the one year anniversary of her passing, I am exceptionally proud to launch the reinvention of our chapter program here today in honor of Luli. And to help me do that, I'm delighted to introduce four very special people that are gonna help um, talk a little bit about Luli and about our chapter program and usher in this next generation of our chapter program. And those four, four people are Gordon Gund, co-founder and ex-chair of the Foundation Fighting Blindness, Debbie Shaw, who's a national trustee for the Foundation Fighting Blindness, Nancy Casentino, um, who is Luli's dear friend, and our beloved Evan Mittman, who is a uh, board member and a past chapter president. So uh, Chris, please share the video with everyone here today. Louis started the first chapter ever of the foundation. And once we started getting feedback on how many people were actually affected and how many people cared about this, we started chapter programs so we could broaden the reach of the whole effort. And so she decided as a model to start the one here in central New Jersey. She ran it for 48 years. Lulu was the most egalitarian person I think I've ever met. She was a real lesson in how you listen to other people. And everybody was just as important to her as the next person. The chapters are extraordinarily important. Luli started the first one, and I think now to reinvigorate that idea is very, very important. Luli felt, and I joined her in this, that we needed to spread the word in a grassroots sense so we could broaden the reach of, of the whole effort. You can help each other by communicating and the best way to do that is with chapter outreach. 
without the events created by the chapters, we wouldn't have the funding. So it's a very necessary part. The chapters get to know families and people who care about the whole program beyond the scope of the national work. This new initiative will be known as Luli Gunn's Next Chapter for Light and Vision. The Luli's Next Chapter for Light and Vision mark was designed first and foremost to honor Luli herself. The L monogram combines a classic pedestal symbolizing our reverence for Luli with an eternal flame representing a guiding light for the chapter program. In addition to serving as a monogram for Luli and the Light and Vision program, the L is the Roman numeral 50, which signifies the Foundation Fighting Blindness's 50th anniversary year. One of the keys to the future of our chapter program is sustainable leadership so that we plan on having succession for each chapter leader. I think this next chapter is going to be very exciting because it's going to introduce the new and younger people into the organization and get some new perspectives, new ideas in order to take the foundation forward. And that's what it's all about. This has been a major cornerstone over the last 50 years, and it's time to reinvigorate it, rejuvenate it, get it energized for the next whatever years it's gonna take, hopefully nothing like that, till we fulfill the mission of the Foundation Fighting Blindness. To learn more or to join a chapter, visit fightingblindness.org slash chapters or call 800-683-5555. Awesome. You know, it's it's really interesting because we're all in different rooms in different parts of the country right now. But if we were all together in a, in a ballroom, the energy of everyone together thinking about what we're doing and sort of reflecting on the past 50 years and Luli's legacy, um, you know, this it would be a, a terrific and emotional moment. So don't let the fact that we're not all together um, take anything away from that because this is a really special moment for the foundation and it's a really special moment specifically for our chapter program. And as you just heard, beginning this week, we're renaming our national chapter program, Luli's next chapter for light and vision. And um, there's a bit more to it. So it's not just a, a beautiful new logo or a new name. There's actually tangible actions and activities that we're taking to reinvent the chapter program. And so I'm actually gonna play another clip um, here in a second. It's gonna be an audio only, there will be no, no video. And it's gonna describe in a little bit more detail the vision that we have for this next generation of our chapter program. So Chris, can you go ahead and play the audio? From the beginning, Luli was there. It was her voice that inspired him in the early days of Gordon Gunn's fight against retinitis pigmentosa. It was her presence, her guiding hand, helping him realize his vision for the Foundation Fighting Blindness. As the Foundation enters its 50th year, we begin Luli's next chapter for Light and Vision. The chapter program, originally conceived by Luli herself, is the backbone of the Foundation's mission. It provides resources, education, and revenue in the fight against the entire spectrum of blinding retinal diseases. For the Foundation, it's important that Luli's guidance, her inspiration, her memory remain at the core of the work of the chapter program. Luli's next chapter will include transformational initiatives, such as Luli's leadership training, which will bring together the best of chapter leadership to participate in leadership training and team development seminars. And Luli's Light Award, which will annually recognize the work and impact of leadership from the Foundation's chapter network around the nation. Luli's next chapter will ensure that all of our chapters, like Luli, will always be there. Thank you, Chris. And, um, you know, we've got many, many people on the on the call here today who have been a part of our chapter program for many years and, and others that this may be the first time that they're ever being exposed to what the Foundation Fighting Blindness chapter program is all about. And, um, you know, this is a great time. This is a great time to get involved in our chapter program. 
and get involved with all the activities uh, at the local communities, the grassroots of, the, of the, the foundation. That's really the heart of what we do. And so if you've never been involved in our chapters before, or even if you have and haven't uh, been to any of our programs lately, I really encourage you to go to our website, www.fightingblindness.org, go to the chapter section and learn more, uh, join the chapter meetings. Um, we'll be back live before you know it in person. Um, but even, even in times like this, where we have events like we have today, it's a great way to, to participate in the process of um, pushing for treatments and cures for blinding and hair to retinal diseases. Um, I would like to take just a second and thank the team who has been guiding the ship with this. Um, that's uh, Judy Taylor, Chris Adams, and Renee Paulsell. And uh, I just encourage everyone just to stay tuned in the coming weeks. There'll be a lot more detail as this rolls out. And uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity today to start today's call with a preview of what we envision for Luli's next chapter. I'd like to now turn the call over to our host for today, and that is our chapter president from our Boston chapter, uh, my dear friend, Ms. Martha Steele. Thank you so much, Jason, and welcome everyone to today's uh, Foundation Fighting Blindness National Chapter Vision Seminar for the latest on stem cell research on inherited retinal diseases. My name is Martha Steele, and I have Usher syndrome, which is a combination of retinitis pigmentosa and hearing loss, and I currently have some light perception and two cochlear implants. I've been chapter president in Boston for a number of years now and currently sit on the foundation board of directors. And I have also been chairing the Boston Vision Walk, which over the course of 13 years has raised over $2 million to help fund research. You know, Boston is not just Boston. The Boston chapter actually represents a lot of people all across New England. And we have participants in, in a number of the New England states, including Vermont, where I spend part of my year. You may see a little snow in the background. Uh, we also host a variety of social gatherings to help us connect with each other, talk to each other, support each other, learn about research, and just in general share experiences on how we cope with our vision loss. I am really very excited about the presentations today because these are three of the world's, not just the countries, the world's leading researchers on stem cell research and their presentations on their different approaches to potential interventions for inherited retinal diseases. Given the fact that these diseases are caused by so many genetic mutations, potential interventions such as those based on stem cells that can be applicable and effective across a variety of inherited retinal diseases, regardless of the gene involved, hold great promise. I would also note that no single intervention, stem cell or otherwise, is likely to be effective for all of us altogether, and thus multiple approaches, multiple treatment options are likely going to be needed across the spectrum of inherited oh, retinal oh, diseases and oh, for different stages of our diseases, be they early, mid or late stage. And so it really, we place an emphasis on the diversification of research investments on a variety of different potential approaches and stem cells is just part of that diversification which the foundation practices when they decide on what research to fund. There are a lot of different potential approaches. If you're like me, you want treatments like me yesterday. And if you're like me, you can get a little frustrated because you think it's not really going very far. It's not going fast enough. We're not getting there fast enough. But the fact is, today, we are far closer to potential treatments. In fact, there is one available treatment in the clinic for a particular um, form of LCA, but we're far closer than we were 10 years ago, never mind 50 years ago, when Gordon and company founded the FFB. And so 
as you listen to today's seminar. First, I want to thank all of you who have supported the foundation. And I want to encourage that you continue to support the research because in the end, if we don't support the research, then who will? We are the affected community and it's incumbent on us to try to support research, whether it comes in time to benefit each one of us or not. Ultimately, my goal, as we heard in the video just now, which I had not heard before, my goal is that the foundation close its doors forever because it will have accomplished its mission of finding treatments and cures. I would encourage, as Jason did, to get involved with local chapters. There are chapters all across the country and they really are the lifeblood of the foundation in terms of spreading the word. So sit back. <clears throat> I hope you enjoy the seminar. I hope you have lots of questions. I am going to now introduce, reintroduce uh, you to Ben Shaberman, who is the Senior uh, Director of Scientific Outreach and Community Engagement at the Foundation. And Ben is going to present a little bit of background on stem cells before we launch into the specific presentations of our experts. Ben has been with the Foundation for 16 years, and I will say he is my go-to guy whenever I have a question about research or about the diseases. Ben has been terrifically helpful to me and many other people. There's nothing he likes better than sitting down and talking one-on-one -on -one with constituents and he is very, very good at it, trust me. And so you will learn a lot from Ben and he is accessible, he is very responsive and he's a nice guy to boot. So, uh, enjoy and thank you so much for your support and thank you so much for joining us and uh, I hope you enjoy the presentation. Take it away, Ben. Well, thank you, Martha. Thank you for that kind introduction. And not only do I want to thank you for all you've done over so many years to drive our mission and, and raise some significant dollars, you have really grasped and communicated the science well. Um, I, I can't think of a constituent that knows science better. And I know you recently put together a stem cell paper that um, could have come from a researcher. So kudos to you for embracing and communicating the science so well. Thank you. So as Martha said, I'm going to provide a brief introduction to stem cells to help you appreciate and better understand the research that you're gonna hear about from our three esteemed um, stem cell researchers. They really are the three of the best in the world. And when they all agreed to be part of this uh, presentation, I was delighted and it is a privilege um, to have them here. One comment I wanted to make before I got started is each of these investigators has been funded by the foundation for many, many years. And a lot of the great work you're going to be hearing about was made possible by you, those of you out there who are supporting the mission through so many different ways. So thank you to you for helping make uh, the great research you're about to learn about possible. Now, before I officially um, begin here, I wanted to thank our sponsors who play an important role in making uh, webinars like this possible. Our visionary champion partner is Genentech. Our outreach gold partner is AGTC. Our outreach silver partners are um, Apellus, Astellus, Biogen, Mira GTX, and Spark Therapeutics. And our outreach bronze partner is Johnson & Johnson Vision. So thanks again to all those partners, sponsors for their support of the webinar. So to begin, I just have a few slides, but to begin, I just wanted to give you a basic definition of stem cells. And usually when we think of stem cells, we are thinking of pluripotent stem cells. 
And basically this kind of stem cell is a cell that's a clean slate. It can be made into virtually any cell type in the body, bone, muscle, retina, and obviously in our case, that's what we're interested in making stem cells into, our retinal cells like photoreceptors or RPE cells. So the ability to make so many different cell types is an important characteristic of pluripotent stem cells. Another important characteristic is that they can be easily replicated. So you can take a small sample of pluripotent stem cells and literally make billions and billions of the cell type you need. So that replicability really is important when we think about making a lot of therapies for a trial or a future treatment. Now, pluripotent stem cells uh, can be derived from a few different um, sources. There are embryonic stem cells, which are pluripotent, and a, a newer technique for deriving pluripotent stem cells is a process we call inducing pluripotent stem cells. And that's a very cool process. That's where we take just skin or bone mature, I, I'm sorry, skin or blood, uh, mature cells from a patient or a healthy donor, and we genetically tweak those so they revert back to a stem cell state. And then they can be coaxed forward to become retina, photoreceptors, RPE cells. So that's a great way to uh, derive these pluripotent stem cells. And you'll be, I'm sure, hearing more about that approach from our experts. Now, another type of stem cell that is sometimes used uh, in therapy development is called an adult stem cell. And these are stem cells that are already in our bodies. They're found in mature tissue and organs. You don't have to do anything to them to make them quote unquote stem cells, but they're part of our body's repair and replenishment system. So we all go through illnesses and we may have injuries and just unfortunately getting older, we need to regenerate some of our tissues and organs. And that's what adult stem cells are all about. Now, these stem cells aren't as flexible as the pluripotent variety. You can only make a limited type of stem of cell types from them. But again, they are, um, it, are being studied in some um, labs as uh, treatment candidates. Now, the other type of stem cell I wanted to mention is something called a progenitor. And this is a cell, a stem cell that's basically um, a step away from becoming the target cell type that you're interested in. And you're going to be hearing about retinal progenitors. These are cells that have almost become photoreceptors. They really don't have any stemness left because their fate has been determined and they are less um, easily replicated than pluripotent stem cells, but they are at a stage which makes them very attractive for therapies. And I'm sure we're going to be hearing more about that from our panel. And again, those are retinal progenitors. Now, moving on, I just wanted to talk about some of the applications for stem cells. The one that I think we're most aware of and interested in is replacing cells lost to retinal disease, replacing photoreceptors, the rods and cones. As we know, photoreceptors make vision possible. And when we lose photoreceptors, we lose vision. If we can replace those, then we can potentially restore vision. Now, another cell type that is lost in retinal diseases is or are retinal pigment epithelial cells or RPE cells. They provide support to photoreceptors and they're often lost in macular diseases like AMD and Stargardt disease. And replacing those may be important if we're gonna help patients. And then there are some emerging treatments that combine these cell types in let's say a patch to address people who have lost 
both cell types. That happens to be an approach that Dr. Gam has been developing for quite some time, and I'm sure you're going to hear more about that. So RPE cells combined with photoreceptors. And it, again, in most cases, when we're talking about um, replacing these lost cells, we're, we're hoping to restore vision for people who have lost vision. Now, another approach for stem cells is not to replace cells or restore vision, it's to protect the cells that are remaining. And we often refer to this as neuroprotection. And the cells that are transplanted or injected into the patient, in this case, aren't replacing anything, but they're producing and secreting proteins or growth factors that help keep the retina healthy. And the idea again is to preserve vision. Perhaps it'll boost vision a little bit when they're first applied. But again, the goal is to save what you have with these neuroprotective therapies. And then finally, an important application for stem cells is to model disease. So we can take stem cells, differentiate them into photoreceptors or RPE and study them in a dish. Uh, over the last uh, few years, investigators have been making what we call 3D retinal organoids, which are sort of rudimentary retinas, also for modeling disease and screening therapies. And actually this colorful circular image on the right side of the slide here is a 3D retinal organo organoid as produced by one of our panelists, uh, David Gam. That's a, a very beautiful looking um, uh, organoid and it has a lot of important applications as I just mentioned. So to conclude, Actually, Martha already helped me make my first um, uh, closing statement here, is that most stem cell therapies are designed to work independent of the mutated gene causing the retinal disease. And that's a really nice characteristic of this approach. So regardless of what your mutated gene is, or even if you don't know what your mutated gene is, stem cells may be applicable. What's most important when you're thinking about a stem cell therapy and which therapy may be applicable is the structure of your retina, how severe uh, the degeneration has been, what cells are left, and that will help you and actually help your doctor and researchers give you a better idea of what stem cell therapy is most appropriate. So that concludes my brief introduction. And now it's my pleasure to begin introducing our three experts and each will give you about a 15 or 20 minute presentation. And as I mentioned at the beginning, when, they're, when they conclude, we should have about a half hour left for your questions. You can um, submit your questions through the Q&A uh, section on the menu bar at the top of the screen, or you can um, use chat as well. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first presenter, Dr. Michael Young, and he is a PhD at Mass Eye and Ear. He serves as director of the Minda de Gunsberg Center for Retinal Regeneration and at Harvard Medical School. He is the Associate Professor of Ophthalmology and Co-Director of Ocular Regenerative Medicine of the Ocular Regenerative Medicine Institute. So Mike, Dr. Young, take it away. Good morning, good afternoon, everybody. It's my pleasure to be here today. Um, I've chosen not to give slides during my presentation, but I have them in front of me um, to help me along. Um, so I've been asked to talk to you today about two clinical trials ongoing now for retinitis pigmentosa. Um, one uh, technology that was developed in my lab some years ago um, that, that is being um, taken forward by a company out of Wales in the UK called ReNeuron, and another um, developed by a colleague of mine, Henry Claussen, 
at a company called JSite in Irvine, California. Now, both of these trials have progressed to the late phase two of the clinical trial, and both are targeting retinitis pigmentosa. So as, as you've heard today, retinitis pigmentosa are a group of hereditary diseases causing retinal degeneration. Typically rod photoreceptors die first. Um, these are rare diseases affecting approximately one in 4,000 patients in the US. And typically early onset, 10 to 30 years is most typical, although um, this varies a great deal as many of you know. So more than 100 mutations in more than 35 genes cause photoreceptor death and retinal dystrophy, again, typically in rods, although cones can be involved as well. So what's exciting and what's new is that there are many different therapies being developed for these diseases. These include gene therapy, neuroprotection, prosthetic chips, optogenetics, a relatively new technology that's making great progress, um, that's when you make non-photosensitive cells respond to light. And what I'm going to talk to you about today is cell replacement, or in the case of J-site, um, cell transplantation for the purpose of retinal preservation. And as you heard, um, the structure and function of the retina typically um, determines which therapeutic modality is going to be most efficient for you in these new therapies that are being developed. So age-related macular regeneration is another target for regenerative medicine. This is more complicated, um, but less rare. Um, typically, the retinal pigment epithelium cone interface is dystrophic, and that typically will require a multilaminar graft, and you'll hear about that from Dr. Gam later in the program today. So yes, what's new with stem cells? Retinal transplantation has been around for a long time, but without stem cells. And these therapies typically fail because of a lack of communication between the donor and the host. What's new is that stem cells have overcome that barrier of communication, something we call integration. So retinal transplants using stem cells are able to integrate with the host tissue. And what that really means is form synapses, form neural connections between the donor and the host. The new challenge that's arisen with this breakthrough, I would say, is to harness the plasticity of stem cells. And for that, differentiation is the key. And that's really going to be the highlight for today's lectures from all of us, is um, differentiating your cells into the appropriate cell type so that repair can take place. So most of what you're going to hear about today involves photoreceptors, rods and cones. And you can get rods and cones from various sources. These include, as you'll hear, from pluripotent or induced pluripotent stem cells. They can come from the endogenous retinal cells as well. And Tom, will, Tom Ray will talk about that in his lecture. Um, but they can also come from retina. So these are the retinal progenitor cells that Ben talked about. Um, so you can get these cells from lots of places. You can transplant them under the retina in what we call the subretinal space. Um, but there are a lot of other factors to be considered, and these include safety, and that involves lineage restriction. Um, you want these cells to become just the cells you desire, and again, that most often involves rods and cones. You need to scale up, and that means there has to be some level of proliferation of these cells um, that they can be differentiated and proliferated, typically under xeno-free xeno conditions, only using human molecules. And that's critical for translation of this work into the clinic. So as a pluripotent stem cell or a multipotent retinal progenitor cell develops, it goes through many stages. And the cells that I'm going to talk to you about today are harnessed at one particular phase, which we will call lineage-restricted progenitors. What that means is they are destined to make retinal neurons, um, they are um, proliferative, meaning that you can grow them into large numbers of cells. And for the work in my lab, that really hinged upon a technique in which we grew these cells at low oxygen conditions in an incubator. And that allowed us to expand them greatly 
so that we could generate enough cells for a clinical trial. So this approach, as I mentioned, is uh, um, retinal progenitor cell based. These are isolated from fetal donor eyes. So eyes at a specific gestational age are isolated, dissected, turned into a single cell suspension, and then expanded in culture um, under low oxygen conditions. So key to this work is minimal manipulation. So that makes these cells very safe and allowed them to go into a first in man clinical trial. Um, safety is key to all these early clinical trials. And, and that's why I think these cells uh, made it to the finish line first. So what do we do with these cells? They are grafted under the retina as a single cell suspension. So there are lots of ways to deliver cells in the subretinal space, either as a organized sheet, as a single cell suspension, or as a multi-laminar graft. All of these are being um, developed um, preclinically. Um, this is a single cell suspension. So basically a soup of cells that is injected under the retina. Now we did lots of work in mice and rats and specifically funded by the foundation work in pigs that taught us that one of the mechanisms of actions of these cells is cell replacement. So the re-neuron work that I'm gonna to describe to you now, the clinical trial has two potential mechanisms of action. First, first, uh, first um, preservation, they do secrete growth factors and things known as exosomes that can preserve the retina, but they also, based upon our pig work, can replace photoreceptors and make new rods, mostly rods, maybe some cones, but mostly rods in this case. So again, the company running this clinical trial is called ReNeuron. Um, they are based out of the UK. And this initial trial was designed as a safety trial um, that started at Mass Eye and Ear and went through the Food and Drug Administration, the FDA, and started in 2016. Um, again, at Mass Eye and Ear, um, lots of benefits to doing a trial in an orphan indication. Um, things like fast track status, an orphan indication, all of these things get you into the clinic in an easier fashion because you're treating a limited number of patients. So the first trial, the first phase of this trial, I, I should say, was designed as a safety trial, of course. That's the way it always works. So the safety was the primary indication, but there were secondary outcomes as well, primarily visual acuity. Other measures such as field sensitivity, retinal photography, fundus autofluorescence, and something known as OCT, a way to take a snapshot of the retinal thickness, have also been performed. So one thing to note is that this is an allogeneic therapy. And that is, it's a universal cell that can function as a universal donor tissue, irregardless of the um, genetic background of the patient. So that includes um, being agnostic to gene mutation, but also agnostic to geno to, I'm sorry, to um, immunological background. Okay, so these cells are very privileged immunologically and the patients do not receive chronic immunosuppression, but simply local anti-inflammatory treatment um, as needed. Okay. So I'm gonna take you through some of the early data, um, but the highlight of this data I have to make clear is that the, as it was a safety trial, that these cells turned out to be quite safe with very few adverse events related to the cells themselves. Um, a couple of things to note, although it didn't start out that way, the company developed a cryopreserved formulation, which meant that they could be thawed in the operating room and injected under the patient. Under the, under the retina of the patient. Um, but a couple of key highlights um, really relate to um, early efficacy data that's been found in the re-neuron trial and in the j site trial as well, which I'll talk to you about briefly in a moment. Um, but the key factor is that the safety was, was quite good and that the early indication of efficacy um, came out in the phase two trial. So in the phase one trial, four cohorts of three patients each 
Um, so a total of 12 patients were injected in a dose escalation study from 250,000 cells up to a million cells per patient. And again, this is a one-time injection in the case of Reneuron. So uh, up to a million cells were injected into the subretinal space in phase one and safety, the good safety profile allowed them to move into a phase 2A trial of 10 patients, again with retinitis pigmentosa, all at 1 million cells per dose. And again, the primary endpoint in a phase two trial remains safety, but visual acuity, visual field, retinal sensitivity, and retinal structure were also evaluated. So the key is that um, there was a good evidence in this preliminary phase two study of efficacy, and that is measured in visual acuity primarily. And the data at um, one year, so one year after injection, patients in the treated eye had approximately 13 letters improvement over the control. So that means about 10 letters of improvement in the treated patients and in the untreated eye, as is the case for degenerative disease, they lost about 2.4 letters of vision. And that gets us to a difference of 12.3 letters um, average per patient. But there was a difference in individual patients. Um, I'm looking now at um, seven patients in phase 2A that were evaluated with what we call EDTRS. So this is the big eye chart with the big E at the top. Um, so they range from two letters of improvement all the way up to one patient who had a 20 letter improvement. And so transplanting cells under the subretinal space is not easy. Um, you get some variability in the detachment and that likely leads to a difference in the improvement in the patients. Again, these are all different genotypes that probably um, relates to the different improvements. But in general, there was a trend toward a significant improvement in all patients that were transplanted. So there we are at the, at the end of the, at the phase two, res, two A results. They're now moving into what is called an extension of phase two A, more patients. Um, they've decided on a dose escalation to 2 million cells as the, 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 the result was better with the higher number of cells. But a couple of key changes in the, in the design of the study is that they really want to be able to perform micro perimetry and see that means the study of where this improvement is located. I'm looking at a map of the retina to see what the improvement is and where it is. So that means you have to choose your patients based upon that. They also want to take additional baseline visual acuity measurements to ensure the reliability of the measurements that they're doing after the injection. And there'll be some modification to the injection site placement to avoid areas of viable retina. That's critical to under, understanding the mechanism of action, whether it's rescue versus repair, whether it's cell replacement or cell preservation. So those are all things that are coming in the next phase. Um, there will be 22 patients in this next phase, and they will be followed for 24 months. Uh, the high-dose expansion study, I believe the data that I have here was that first patient has been injected. Um, they, that was in late 2020. Um, there, of course, have been a, a, a delay in patients with COVID, but that has now restarted. And the plan is for um, a progression, of course, into a phase three, which is the pivotal study, which will really determine um, whether these cells work or not in a large study. And there will be three patient groups in that study. It will be randomized, but not placebo controlled. Always complicated whether you're going to do a placebo controlled study with an invasive procedure such as a subretinal injection. Um, but there will be a high dose, a low dose, and an observational cohort in that group. So now I'll take you quickly um, to a different approach, the j site approach. The cells that they're injecting in the j site group are quite similar. They are expanded retinal progenitor cells derived from fetal retina. The difference is the ejection site. That's the major difference. So these cells are injected 
in the vitriol space, not under the retina, but above the retina in the vitriol space between the lens and the retina itself. And this approach is thought to be um, a mechanism of delivering growth factors to the retina to save neurons from dying. Okay, so Ben mentioned that it's really critical to look carefully at the injection, um, at, the, at the patient's structure and function to determine which mechanism is best served in a, in a regenerative medicine technique. And so in the case of J-site, um, retinal neurons must be, must be there for this mechanism to take place. So you have to save the retina that is there. And so um, they've also found some really good benefit in their phase 2B study. So they're a little bit further along. They're in a phase 2B study. Um, They've also received all of these benefits from the government of doing a, of a orphan disease therapy. Um, but J-site, um, their cells are called J-cells and they remain in the vitreous for a long period of time, up to one year after injection. Again, these cells release neurotrophic factors to release, to reduce cell death and maybe even promote function of existing retinal photoreceptors. So there can be a, a visual improvement if the photoreceptors that are there are induced to work better. And maybe that means developing new outer segments, these little structures that are um, actually capturing photons of light. Um, that's one possibility for their mechanism of action. Again, these, this therapy does not require a specific genotype. So many different types of RQP can be treated with this cell therapy. Um, unlike the reneuron approach, though, these cells can be redosed. So you may be able to give this therapy over and over again if it proves to be effective. And they're planning on doing just that. Um, so they put a lot of cells in. Up to 6 million cells are injected into the vitreous. They have a sham control, a 3 million cell group, and a 6 million cell group injected into the vitreous chamber, a total of 84 patients of which 74 were included in the final protocol were injected. And again, with a, with a very good safety profile, several, um, it's a larger study, so there were several adverse events related to treatment, but they proved to be quite rare. Um, they also looked at the best corrected visual acuity from baseline. And in the case of they, also, they looked at a couple of other parameters, light mobility, again, visual field, contract sensitivity, and visual acuity, visual acuity quality of life questionnaire was also um, performed. But they really hang their hat on the visual acuity. That's the most important measure in, in these early studies. And they saw an improvement of about four lines of vision, 4.4 lines of vision relative to control at the same 12-month endpoint. So again, they, they, they saw 7.4 lines of improvement in the treated group. And in the untreated and control group, they saw an improvement of three lines of vision. So a, a mean difference of about 4.4 lines of vision improvement. Now they did see a lot of improvement in what they call the kinetic visual field and contrast sensitivity, um, less so in their low, might, low light mobility and in the visual acuity questionnaire. Um, yeah, so they continue working toward a pivotal phase tr three trial in retinitis pigmentosa. They're developing this therapy also for dry AMD and other retinal dystrophy, such as cone rod, Stargardt's disease. And they think this approach of delivering neuroprotective factors is relevant for things such as diabetic retinopathy and even for other retinal neurons like ganglion cells. And so they're also targeting glaucoma and other optic neuropathies. So just to summarize, as I think I'm out of time, um, it's early days in these early clinical trials. The take home message is these, these therapies seem to be very safe and that's somewhat of a surprise to many people. These are, these are invasive procedures of injecting foreign cells under or on top of the retina, but the overall safety profile seems to be very positive. And there are some really good indications that some of these patients are getting a lot of vision back 
some less vision, but some a great deal of vision back. And I think that bodes really well for the future of the new therapies that are being developed by um, Dr. Gam and Dr. Ray. Um, this was, you know, stem cells 1.0. There are new therapies being developed as well in my laboratory, as well as other laboratories around the world. But this first in man study proved to be very safe and effective um, in, in, in many patients. So I, I, I think it's, it's really good news. And I'll stop there. Thank you, Dr. Young. Uh, before we move ahead, I did have one question. I'm just curious. You're, you're very humble about all the work you did that helped make the Reneuron trial possible because you played a big role in um, the lab research that made that possible. But my question is, how many years of research do you think, at least what you were involved in, went into the um, therapy that made the Reneuron trial possible? That depends on where you consider we started, but from the very first um, mouse study, let's say when we isolated mouse retinal progenitor cells, it was about 10 years, 10 to 12 years before the first patient was dosed. And so that takes you through mouse studies, rat studies, pig studies, growing human cells, um, and all the regulatory steps that it takes. So um, we hope we can do it faster with 2.0. Um, but uh, we learned a lot with that work, um, but it, it takes a long time. It takes a lot of investment. And again, the foundation, I didn't mention much about the pig study, but the pig study that the foundation funded um, really allowed us to address things like dosage um, that we think we got right in the end, um, immunosuppression protocol and cell placement. All of these things came out of that critical study um, that we did with the foundation. Um, so it, it takes a lot of different studies to pull together a clinical trial. Right. Well, thank you for the great work and, and thank you for the excellent presentation today. And uh, we'll, we'll get to the questions, uh, more questions after our next two presenters. And next up is uh, Dr. Tom Ray. And Dr. Ray, uh, feel free to take over the screen with your slides. Uh, Dr. Ray is the Biological Structure Professor at the Institute for Stem Cells and Regenerative Medicine at the University of Washington. It's all yours, Dr. Ray. And make sure you're unmuted. <laughs> Perfect. Thanks. Sure. <laughs> was All right. Well, thank you for the opportunity to, to speak today and present um, some of the work that we're doing towards um, trying to regenerate the retina. Um, I want to thank the foundation up front for funding our work over many, many years. And as, as um, you know, we all know, it takes a lot of really a lot of faith and hope that these approaches that are really start out as long shots will ever make it to helping somebody. But I think what we just heard from Dr. Young is a beautiful example of um, how starting really with laboratory studies and kind of an idea that a particular approach might work to getting it all the way to where you're actually testing it out in people, it's a, it's a really long road. And, um, and it's really quite impressive um, when you see, when you look back on how many years it takes um, that the, some of these ideas that we had, you know, 20 years ago are, are finally reaching the point where uh, they're, they're becoming, um, you know, potential therapies and helping people. Um, that's really what we're, we're striving for. Um, sometimes, as, as we know, it takes a long time to realize these things. And partly it's because sometimes something very simple, in principle, uh, is very complex in the details. So that's certainly something that we, we appreciate and are always humbled by is uh, the, the ability of, um, of, of biology to, to do certain things and the ability of diseases to, uh, to stymie those things. But I think we also recognize, and I think we've had a really a wonderful example over the past year that even something as devastating as a COVID pandemic if sciences get together and you know we invest we invest resources in this, we can develop therapies, vaccines that can you know hopefully turn turn this around. So we really see our 
our um, goals as the equivalent to that in, in trying to restore um, vision to people who've lost it due to the degeneration of retinal cells. And I think, and, and basically what I wanna to do today is just describe our ideas, our approach. We're still a long way from clinical trial, um, but I think what we, what we can say is that we have a path that we can follow now, kind of in the footsteps of some of the other people that have already moved from the lab to the, to the clinical trials. We, we think we have a path forward and maybe applying this approach to, um, to repairing the retina. So I, I do have slides, but I really won't um, depend on anybody actually seeing any of them. Um, but I think that they can be, uh, for those that, that can see these slides, um, I want to just outline in a very simple way uh, what we're trying to do. And I think, like I said, conceptually, it is a pretty simple approach. Um, but, you know, it, it will, it is, the details are, are the things that, that we spend most of our days trying to work out. Now, this approach is grounded in, in biology um, in the following way. There are animals. In fact, animals not that different from us, although you might think they're quite different, but things like fish and frogs and salamanders and newts and, you know, the vertebrates that we would call um, non-mammalian vertebrates. And many of these animals have the ability to repair their retina, kind of like the way we would repair uh, you know, a cut to the skin. So for example, if you get a, a cut, you know, you nick yourself with a knife or something like that, uh, you bleed a little bit, but the wound heals, the skin re, uh, re, re coats the wound and pretty soon you might have a little bit of a scar, but in general, you'll often get a complete healing of that wound to your skin. And this is really an amazing process, uh, but we sort of take it for granted because it happens just naturally to us. Now, something similar to that happens in a fish to their retina. So if a fish has ret the equivalent of retinitis pigmentosa, a mutation in one of the genes of its um, rod photoreceptors, which they have just like ours, but you can make the same mutation in a fish, a zebra fish um, that a person might have, and it'll lead to the degeneration of those rods in the fish. But the fish has this ability almost like the way, uh, way our skin heals, the fish has the ability to heal their retina so that when those rod cells die, new ones are recreated and fill in for the old ones. Now, the mutation hasn't been corrected in the fish, so they have to just keep doing this. It would be like you have to cut yourself again and then you get healing again and cut yourself again and heal. So the fish is constantly, if the fish with retinitis pigmentosa is constantly making new cells to fill in the ones that are dying. But nevertheless, that works. He can see and uh, he doesn't degenerate his vision. He doesn't lose his visual acuity. He doesn't lose his cone vision. He can literally just keep restoring uh, those rods as they die. So in some ways that's that would be remarkable, if we had that ability, we, we wouldn't have this foundation because essentially we would be just fixing our retinas intrinsically and we wouldn't even notice it. Um, we can't do that. And unfortunately, most, uh, it, well, really all, all mammals, uh, things with fur and warm, uh, dogs, cats, mice, they can't do it either. So we're all in the same boat. We can't fix our retinas the way we would like it, like to. But what we'd like to do is make the human retina like the fish retina and its ability to repair itself. Uh, we wanna make our retina more like the way our skin heals. So how do we do it? And I wanna take you through uh, the way we're, we're, we're working on this. And um, this would not require uh, transplantation of cells. Um, it wouldn't require growing stem cells in a dish. In some ways, we've heard about uh, progenitor cells, um, but you know, again, these come, in the case of Dr. Young's studies, these come from fetal human retinas and are grown in dishes outside of the, of the body, and then they're implanted into the body. What we picture is a kind of an induced progenitor cell. Um, the retina doesn't have stem cells 
in, our, in adults. There are no cells that naturally act to repair it um, like they do in the fish. So you can think that the fish does have these stem cells built in, they're kind of like progenitor cells and they just repair the rods and the cones as they die. So how do we make our retina have these induced uh, rods and cones, induced progenitor cells that can make rods and cones? So I am going to move my slide forward. Okay, so this is, uh, so the retina is basically made up of cells and you guys know this already. I'm sure you've heard this over and over, but each one of these cells has a different job. And so the rods and the cones are the cells that receive the light, uh, the rods for the nighttime vision and the cones for the daytime vision and the high visual acuity. Um, in addition to these cells like rods and cones, there are other types of neurons in the retina that take the signal from the rods and cones and relay them to the brain. And one of these cells might be called, it is called the ganglion cell. Um, and the ganglion cell has long axons and these axons are the wires that basically connect the retina to the brain through the optic nerve. Now, in retinitis pigmentosa, um, the rod cells um, are usually the first to go. And when the rod cells are degenerated and lost, um, that accounts for a large amount of the sort of the beginnings of the retinal disease. The, the, uh, clearly, in many people, you don't have a lot of night vision ever. Um, but as these cells die, um, night vision um, can for many people can um, get worse. But daytime vision, as I said, is mediated by the cones and uh, through processes that people are working to understand and have some insight into, after rod cells die, cone cells um, are lost as well. And when cone cells are lost, then that compound of both losing the rods where the primary lesion often is, and then the cones where the secondary loss occurs, the loss of both the rods and the cones, then really you've got nothing left to turn your light into, into electrical activity that the brain can understand. So with the loss of those photoreceptors, rods and cones, um, as I said, we don't have easy ways to put them back, um, but transplantation, as you'll hear from Dr. Gam, can and, and from Dr. Young, transplantation to the subretinal space um, hopefully can, can restore some of those rods and cones back to the vision. But what the fish does, it takes advantage of this glial cell, it's called. It's called a Mueller glial cell. It was named for a uh, German neuroanatomist, Mueller. And um, he noticed that this cell was in the retina. It didn't look like a neuron exactly. The neurons are the things that you know are, are really creating the functional synapses between one another and conveying the information. But you can think of the glial cell as kind of like a support cell. It, it um, keeps those neurons happy. It feeds the neuron. Neurons are very you know, energy expensive in their job. And so the glial cells are kind of like the support personnel. And they sit around and they, they help out those neurons to, um, to do their normal jobs. In, when retina is damaged in the fish, these glial cells jump into action. And what they do is they, they proliferate and undergo multiple rods of division. And, um, and you can see here, um, what they do is they'll undergo these multiple rounds of cell division, kind of like the progenitors or stem cells that you've, that you've heard about already. And when they undergo these multiple rounds of division, that means they make more cells. So, Cells, just like in your skin, if you have a wound to your skin, you have to fill in the gap. And the way you fill in the gap is the cells right next to the wound, they start to divide. They undergo these mitotic divisions and then they fill in the gap. So in order to make more cells, these Mueller glia have to undergo these mitotic divisions. And in the fish, when they undergo these mitotic divisions, they also become more like the progenitors that you get in fetal retina. Uh, these are progenitors that have the ability to make rods and cones. And then the fish will ultimately go, these progenitors will then go back and differentiate into rods and cones again, and the fish retina is completely fine again. So what we're trying to do is in order to make our Mueller glia do the same thing, we have to add what we call reprogramming factors. So these reprogramming factors are, are genes 
a combination of genes uh, that will actually go into the Mueller glial cells and reprogram them to become like the fish progenitor cells. And these reprogramming factors, we actually figure out which ones to use by looking at the fish and saying, well, why did he make his Mueller glia into progenitors again? And so that's basically what we try to do. We say, we look at the fish, we say, what did they do to make this work? And then we add those same factors back into the mouse. And over the past um, decade or so, we've learned how to do this in mice. And so in mice now, we can make um, these Mueller glia um, go back into the mitotic cell cycle, divide and make more cells. Uh, they can differentiate into different cell types within the retina. Uh, so far, we've been able to find that we can find mixes that will make these Mueller glia turn into bipolar cells, which are the intermediate cells shown here. Uh, we can make them turn into, most recently we found we can make ganglion cells and cones from these Mueller glia, and we're experimenting with other reprogramming factors to, to direct them to alternate fates like rods as well. So, I, so in, our, in our, um, our goal is to basically convert the Mueller glial cells into, into induced progenitor cells, you could say, and these induced progenitor cells can then go on and fix the retina so that we don't need to do the transplantation. Now, this would be for a very end stage disease, I would think, because you know you really, really we're talking about uh, stimulating repair after the cells have all gone, you know, after you've lost the rods and the cones. Um, but I think that it would endow our, our glial cells, if we're successful at this, with the ability to continue to repair as cells die, much like the fish. So how do we get to a place where we could, we could get to someday my reporting uh, on our results of our clinical trial, as Dr. Young just did? I think we're still a long way from that point, but, I, but clearly uh, right now we, we have to make improvements in making this process more efficient. We have to drive, direct these glial cell progenitors to specific cell fates. Right now, we, we set this process in motion like the fish does, but they make all kinds of different cells and we wanna direct them to only the ones that are needed. We, we wanna make rods and cones for, for people with retinitis pigmentosa, but we don't really you know, wanna make more ganglion cells in those people. So we need to get better at directing these cells. Um, we need to find better ways to deliver the reprogramming factors, but I think we already know that uh, these viral vectors like AAV um, have worked in the retina in gene therapy trials. And so we picture a way to deliver these reprogramming factors via AAV in very much the same way uh, that, we, that we are currently doing for gene therapy. So we wouldn't need any cell transplantation, but we would do intravitreal or subretinal injections of the gene therapy. Um, Next, we have to test this all in non-human primates, obviously, before we, or at least some animal with larger eyes, just sort of the path that Dr. Young described and, and Dr. Gam will tell you about. You have to move slowly up um, into larger eyed animals to make it uh, work to, so that you know it'll work in, in something closer to, to us. And then finally develop a preclinical program to test safety. Uh, as, as Dr. Young had said, the safety is really key. And for all these approaches, I think we all have our, our um, you know, we know that that's going to be the most important factor going forward. The FDA, obviously, at, and, and for all the people that want to receive these therapies, we need to make sure that they don't cause more problems than they solve. Um, but I think the foundation, as I said, has been really fantastic at funding this. And and in a really smart way, because one of the things that I think people don't really recognize is that we scientists don't develop these therapies entirely in our labs. Eventually, these things have to be done in partnership with, with biotechnology companies and pharmaceutical companies. And they really like the foundation to partner with, to uh, interact with. They, the foundation provides a lot of what you would call the due diligence for these new therapies that are being developed because the foundation has panels of experts that these industry can call upon. And so I think the, 
in order for them to invest the millions of dollars that it really take that these pharma and biotech to invest the millions of dollars that it takes to move these therapies actually into the clinic, uh, they need to they need to feel confident that that money is well spent. And and so the foundation plays an, a fantastic role at providing researchers ways to um, to uh, meet the diligence requirements of these pharma companies, and also to provide the confidence that uh, foundation and its and its resources uh, back up this research. So I really I really want to say thanks to the foundation and that they've really been instrumental not only in getting our work forward but in all the wonderful. Um, approaches that are being taken right now. So, and with that, I, I'll stop and and uh, take any questions uh, later. Thank you. Thanks, thanks for that great talk, uh, Dr. Ray, and thanks for the great, really cool research you're doing. I call it the grow your own um, research. It's it's uh, really promising. I do have one question. When we talk about many stem cell therapies, where you're um, injecting or transplanting cells into the eye. Obviously, those are procedures and sometimes they may require immunosuppression and you, you worry about whether the cells will survive or not. While your approach is still a ways from the clinic, do you think it will have some advantages over transplantations and injections because the patient will really just be growing their own cells? I think that's the hope. Um, you, know, you wouldn't need an immunosuppression because they will be your own cells. It's a little bit like that there was the promise of induced pluripotent cells because you could take a patient's uh, blood cells or skin cells and induce them to become pluripotent, to grow them into retina that would have the genetic characteristics of that patient's cells. Um, so yes, I think that that, that, is, a, that is an advantage um, with an induced progenitor uh, or an induced adult stem cell uh, approach that we have. The disadvantage obviously is you're not correcting a genetic defect. What's interesting is, you know, the fish, so when, when that rods uh, in, in most patients survive for many, many years before they start to degenerate. And so just like in the fish, the regenerating new rods uh, constantly uh, the cells will survive for some time. Obviously, they won't function if a mutation in a patient has uh, it, it leads to non-functional rods, but the cells might still be there and provide these supportive functions and trophic functions that um, that Mike is as uh, that Dr. Young has has mentioned. So I think that there are advantages and disadvantages, and it's something that Martha mentioned earlier. There's not, and I think you did as well. There's not going to be a one size fits all, but the idea of having multiple parallel um, approaches being developed and all being tested against this, um, you know, these, these, this really variable disease. I think that's, that's really, to me, the, the, um, you know, the way, the way to think about it is it's not going to be um, ever one size for a really complex and variable disease uh, like RP, but having multiple options is, is probably our best bet. Right. Well, thanks again, Dr. Ray. Uh, we appreciate your time and uh, that really excellent presentation. So on to our third presenter. Um, it is my pleasure to welcome Dr. David Gam. He's both an MD and a PhD. And he is the Emmett A. Humble Distinguished Director of the McPherson Eye Research Institute and the Sandra Lemke Trout Chair in Eye Research, Professor of Ophthalmology and Visual Sciences at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And David, I think you should be able to share your slides now. Yep, we see them, thank you. Take it away. And you may be muted I'm as well. I'm mute first. Yeah, that's what I came back to do. So okay. Sure, yeah. Well, thank you, everybody. I, I just want to um, share again my thanks for uh, you taking the time to listen to us this morning and this afternoon, depending upon where you are. And I also want to echo everybody else's comments about the importance of the foundation fighting blindness in all of our research from the very beginning. I think what you're seeing here 
is a lot of progress that didn't start yesterday. In my case, it started back with a very green uh, physician scientist in 2003 uh, who had some ideas um, that not too many people believed in, but uh, the Foundation of Fighting Blindness did, as well as some local folks here in Madison where I'm calling you from today. Uh, so uh, there have been some wonderful questions and chats that have come up that I've been able to follow along uh, the way for the first two wonderful speakers. So I know that there's a lot of questions out there and I don't want to take up uh, too much time. So I'm gonna try and move through my presentation. My laboratory is uh, focused on the use of human pluripotent stem cells. You've heard a lot about that already. And their applications to degenerative diseases that affect both RPE and photoreceptors. So that includes retinitis pigmentosa and includes uh, dry macular degeneration. It includes injuries to the outer retina, includes, including those that are, that are uh, suffered by uh, say, um, our, our soldiers. So you know, we're in a position where we're trying to help a, a wide range of folks, but as has been mentioned repeatedly, and I think it bears repeating again, and that is that there is no silver bullet. And so um, there's a lot of complexity that comes into degenerative diseases of, of the retina uh, that need to be understood to, under, to, to really uh, uh, see where you or your family member might fit in. So the two levels of complexity that have been touched on already are really the wide genetic diversity of, oh, let's go back for here. The wide genetic diversity of, in this case, this is, I'm showing you a, a pie chart of, of non-syndromic retinitis pigmentosa, and there's tons of little slivers in this pie. And what that means is that there are a lot of different genes that can uh, lead to uh, degeneration of photoreceptors or retinal pigment epithelium that ultimately uh, cause vision loss. And we don't even know all of them. There's about a third of them that we don't even, that we can't even find if we uh, clinically designate a person as having retinitis pigmentosa, we can't even find those. Um, so that makes it relatively difficult to uh, develop very focused therapies for each and every one of uh, the people that are within these different pie, uh, slices of the pie. And there are some uh, treatments now that even consider the exact mutation within that gene. And so there can be 200 different mutations within a particular gene. So those are important avenues to gene therapies to go forward, but we also need another thing, a safety net for the folks that kind of fall through the gene, the gene therapy cracks so that we can offer them something as well. Um, so that's one level of complexity, just the, the sheer number of, of different conditions that we're trying to help that currently have uh, uh, no or, or not good enough treatments. And then the second level is where is, is a moving target. So, you may have all these something you know, different than the person next to you. And I've seen a lot of things in the chat talking about, well, what about my particular disorder? And are you gonna talk about X or are you gonna talk about Y? And if we did that, there'd be three to 500 different things to talk about. We certainly can't cram that into two hours. Um, but every one of these conditions that are being brought up on the chat, they all don't exist statically. So they're all changing over time. And you know this because you live with it. So you understand what you had in the past or what your child had in the past and what they've lost over time. And that's devastating to try to watch helplessly as that occurs. But biologically what's happening is those, those cells, those photoreceptors or their helper cells, the retinal pigment epithelium are undergoing a slow degeneration based upon some malfunction. Um, and there's lots of analogies I could use. I love analogies, cars, houses, things like that. I'm happy to go into those, but I'll, I'll forgo you my, my, what I think are clever analogies for now. Um, but what I'm showing in this particular slide that I'll talk through is the photoreceptors are the blue cells and over time they start to become dysfunctional, but they still, they're still there. So they don't do their job, but they haven't died off yet. But eventually if they go long enough, they're going to be gone. And once they're gone, there's no kind of putting Humpty Dumpty back together again. You have to either bypass it, try and get cells to do something different than what they're usually doing, which is what Dr. Ray was talking about, or you try to replace it entirely. And that comes down to, so really what we're, the sweet spot we're looking for here is that area where there's been enough damage done where it warrants trying to replace the cells that have been lost. We really don't wanna aim for the earlier stages, at least not now, because there's risk in any of these experimental therapies. And if you have the potential to keep what you've got before it's fully lost, well then let, let's, let's aim to do that. But if that ship has sailed, then what do we got for the rest of the folks? So focusing in on that loss section is very important. Now you'll see that there's also on the right side, there's a, a point of kind of no return uh, disarray. So you don't just kind of hang out there with the photoreceptors or RPE being gone forever. The rest of the retina 
And some of the cells that are downstream of it that connect those photoreceptors to the brain can also become disorganized or scar or die. In which case, it's a much, much more complex situation in terms of trying to replace not just one cell, but multiple cells or perhaps the entire retina. Um, and so that's further down the line. And unfortunately, some folks are already in those categories. And so it's, it's gonna take longer to address those, those particular problems. Okay, so once you, so if once you identify the problem as being, well, we have to replace them, which is why all, you're all here today, um, then it's a complex puzzle to get from that position back to restoring vision. And this is an oversimplification of a, of a bunch of puzzle pieces, but one of the first ones, if not the first one is, well, what are you gonna use? What, you know, what are you gonna use to plug back in? Where are your spare parts gonna come from? And you've heard from Dr. Young, one possibility. You've heard from Dr. Ray, trying to commandeer other cells within the retina to do that, all very um, uh, promising approaches. And what we've so focused on from the very beginning in part because I'm here in Madison at the University of Wisconsin, which is really the birthplace of pluripotent stem cells with Jamie Thompson's work done in the late 90s. And that is to use human pluripotent stem cells. And the word stem cells, I'll get back to that toward the end, but it's thrown around an awful lot. And it's usually thrown around in order to try to fool you into spending your money that you shouldn't spend or putting yourselves in harm's way to cure what ails you. Um, and I'll finish my talk just by with a brief uh, comment on that, because unfortunately I see an awful lot of folks trying to um, uh, essentially be charlatans and, and sell things to people who are well-meaning and trying to help themselves or their family members, but instead are putting themselves in harm's way or putting their bank accounts in harm's way for no good reason. So the key part here is pluripotent. Pluripotent is what tells you that the stem cells have the capacity to make retina and photoreceptors and RPE. Unfortunately, that's, you know, that's great, but unfortunately it also means, the pluripotent means it can make pretty much anything. So it can make bone, beating heart, uh, cartilage, all the sort of things. And we don't want all of that gamish going inside your eyeball. So it was great that, we, that, this, that this technology came about in the late uh, 90s and then uh, it was induced pluripotent stuff a little bit later on, but you still had to learn how to harness it. And as I just mentioned, there's two types. So there's two types of pluripotent stem cells. The first are embryonic stem cells. And those were initially described in the late 90s. The, you might have heard of the, of the Bush lines. Those are the uh, lines that were approved by uh, George Bush that have been uh, largely used um, in the pluripotent stem cell field. Uh, but then in the mid-2000s, uh, Jamie Thompson, as well as Shinyu Yamanaka in Japan, found a way to obtain what is the equivalent of embryonic stem cells through an induction uh, genetic reprogramming step where you take blood or skin from a, a person walking around who signs a consent form and it's a small bit of, of cells. And then we can genetically reprogram them back to a pluripotent stem cell uh, fate. And really that's what my laboratory uh, and the company that, I, that we started here uses is the induced pluripotent stem cells, largely from blood samples. So we're taking a sample about the size of what you might submit for a cholesterol check and then using those cells, activating them, turning them into pluripotent stem cells. Again, great, but how do you, you could take those same cells and you could make all sorts of different things. So how do you get them to go towards retina? Uh, and that's work that a lot of folks over a long period of time have, have um, uh, put a time and effort into and at the Foundation Fighting Blindness and you in the audience um, have supported. Um, and I would be remiss if I didn't mention that the first definitive uh, demonstration that you could take these wildly um, uh, plastic and very promising cells and make some retina out of them possibly was by Dr. Ray himself, one of the other panelists here. And it was his demonstration of that um, that told me, well, you know, there's a possibility here. It's worth putting effort to see if we can steer this ship in a direction that might help people who have blinding disorders. And over the course of many years, you asked Ben earlier how long these things take, but I'd say about a decade or so, we, developed a way uh, to generate these three-dimensional structures that are about the size of a, of a, uh, a pinhead, a large one, a large pinhead. And what they really are is are they are um, uh, human retinas. Um, and they're, they develop like normal human retinas do. Um, they develop all the different cell types, including photoreceptors in the RPE. And here's a, a colorful picture of a section. If you cut in half one of these these pinheads of human retina developed from an induced pluripotent stem cell. Um, the different uh, dots, the purple dots, the red dots, and the green dots are all photoreceptor cells that have 
uh, been produced over time. And it takes a good amount of time to do this, many, many months, similar to how, it would, how long it would take for your retina to develop inside of the womb. Um, but they develop real photoreceptors and they'll respond to light and they have all the bells and whistles that photoreceptors are supposed to have. And that's important because photoreceptors are actually, and I'm a bit biased, but the most complex cell in your entire body. And so being able to take something that can become anything and coerce it within a laboratory to become something as specific as a photoreceptor is a pretty remarkable feat, I would say. And then here's the other cell type that's of importance to a lot of folks on this call, and that is the retinal pigment epithelium. This is a cell type that acts more like a lawn or the foundation of a house, and it's there to support the photoreceptors so that they can function appropriately. Either one of those cell types, the photoreceptors or the RPE, if they are damaged or lost, will lead to, to, vis to vision loss or blindness, um, in a, in a, maybe in a different order. So if the RPE is lost first, then the photoreceptors are lost shortly thereafter. And both of these cell types can be produced from iPS cells and multiple labs around the world have now shown that this can be done. So it's not just the special barometric pressure in the Midwest or what have you, although we do have lovely weather that is often um, uh, maligned for no good reason. Um, so anyway, um, so that was wonderful. We were able to, and other people were able to uh, develop this, this technology in a laboratory. So in the, where I'm sitting right now, um, on the floor that I'm in in my building. Um, but that's a long way from being able to put that into a human being. Um, and as Dr. Ray mentioned, that really requires partnership with um, uh, uh, biotechnology companies. And so we had the opportunity to start a company um, along with Fujifilm, uh, Fujifilm Cellular Dynamics here in Madison called Opsis Therapeutics. And over the course of four years, we were able to take the technology that we had initiated in my laboratory, but we're still light years away from being able to apply to an actual human safely and, uh, and with enough quantity um, to a, uh, let's make sure, let's see, there we go. We were able to convert that to a protocol that allowed us to scale that up so that we could, and this is what I'm showing you here is what's a, a, three, a three liter bioreactor. So this is about one and a half times the fluid that you would get in a two liter bottle of, of soda pop. Um, and within that, you see billions and billions of photoreceptors and little aggregates of photoreceptors that are being grown. And so we can uh, produce, and these can be done in tandem. So we can have multiple three liters in, in a row. And so at this point we can produce enough of the donor cells, the photoreceptors and RPE, although I'm not showing you that here, uh, to treat entire cities if we needed to do that. Um, and we can also freeze those down, store them and thaw them out and so on and so forth. And so we're, we're very uh, excited about the use of this, both directly as implantation into patients as well as modeling tools so that we can advance other types of therapeutics. Okay, so you have the source of the cell how are you gonna deliver it? How do you package it up? And how do you get it into the patient? Because that's just the first puzzle piece, you know, actually there were a couple of puzzle pieces up there that uh, were um, associated with production of the cells in a, a clinically appropriate manner. But how do we get those now into the subretinal space deep within the eye um, in some pretty inaccessible areas? Now, thankfully, a lot of other groups have worked that out, including uh, the companies and, and the work that Dr. Young has done. And so we didn't have to reinvent the wheel. But one thing that we thought about was that these photoreceptors that we're putting back into that space really have an orientation. They know what up is, what, up is, what down is. Um, they have a, you know, two business ends and those business ends need to find other cells within the retina to hook up to or make what we call synapses. So the delivery portion of it to us was an important um, problem to solve in conjunction with making those cell types. And to do that, we also, um, we turned to some of our wonderful engineers here at the University of Wisconsin, who, who in their day jobs make computer chips. And they make very, very tiny little structures that help run the most complex electronics that we have on this planet. And they're able to do it on a microscopic level, very, very repetitively, and, and they hit a mark every single time. And we said, would you mind taking some of that fancy equipment and knowledge you have there and building us something that we can implant ourselves in so that we can more precisely and in an oriented fashion, create a patch or put those cells in, in a safer manner and perhaps a more efficacious manner as well. And so they did this and they used a molding technique, which means we can do this on pennies on a dollar. 
And the little thing I'm showing you, it looks like a little piece of, of, of cloth on the left is actually one of these scaffolds. We call them scaffolds. Um, and it's about the size of your pinky nail. And we can make them any size or shape. And if you look at them real close, uh, the first version of this, what we call our first generation, was a wine glass type shape. And we could put a photoreceptor or two into each one of these little holes and they would orient themselves. So each one, one of the red lines that you see here is an individual photoreceptor developed from an induced pluripotent stem cell and implanted into one of these holes or wine glass containers in a scaffold. And we can put that into, into um, uh, animals and hopefully patients eventually too. The problem though, you, you, you continue, this is what research is about. You learn as you go. We thought it was a great idea. Turns out though, photoreceptors like to be with their buddies and they don't like to be separated apart. So if you put them individually into their own little wine glass, they get lonely and they don't necessarily um, uh, do the right thing all the times in terms of, in terms of function. Plus, it limits how many cells you can put into the space. And there's a lot of photoreceptors that do a lot of the work of vision in your eye. And so um, just a handful of them might not be enough. So when we went back to our engineers that, uh, and we said, hey, can we, can we make this a little slightly large, different design? And so we came up with this ice cube tray design. Similar idea, but now we have larger wells that are now square. And we have multiple different iterations of this already, by the way that we can now put the photoreceptors in that allows them to be in small communities. And they still orient, and, which is wonderful, and they still sit down inside, inside of these, these, these scaffolds. And everything else that I talked about the first generation holds true with this one as well. And we're on to now second or third generations for different uh, applications. And here's an example of photoreceptors in red and blue and, and the little green dots are, are synapses or little synaptic proteins. And they're all sitting nicely inside of these different wells. And it allows us to place them in a safe manner in the subretinal space. Now, what about retinal pigment epithelium? The nice thing about having scaffolds like this is we can start thinking about building sandwiches. If you have photo, uh, retinal pigment epithelium that's also lost, we can line these wells or these ice cube trays with the RPE cells. And that's what I'm showing on the right are with different various colors showing this retinal pigment epithelial cells that have now lined these, uh, these scaffolds. And we can place the photoreceptors inside of the pockets that remain after the, the RPE is there. So, you know, baby steps towards getting to a position where maybe we can replace multiple cell types. And here's an example of, of uh, a surgery that was done in a pig. Um, and this is with our close collaborators at the National Eye Institute, Kabil Barty and Dr. Juan Amaral, who is the retinal surgeon who did this particular procedure. Um, but there's a special device here that allows, and it's hard, very, I'll walk you through it. So it's a transparent um, uh, scaffold. So it gets slipped through a, an incision in the retina where it sits below the retina. And then the scaffold part dissolves over time. So it doesn't stay there, it dissolves over about two months. Okay, so I'm about ready to wrap up. And but I, the last thing I want you to remember is that like any technology that's ever been made, airplanes, computers, what have you, you don't start with a supercomputer on your wrist. You start with, unfortunately, a giant room full of things that looks at ones and zeros and can barely add. So you got to walk before you crawl, before you walk, before you run. Um, and so none of these therapies are going to be grand slam home runs right out of the gate. We, we hope that they will be A, safe, that they will help people, um, and that they, are, that they will be in a position to um, get, improve over time, that we will go back to the drawing board and say, okay, what works, what doesn't, how can we tweak this, how can we get this to be better? Um, and as long as we continue on that path and that we have integrity uh, and that we're looking at our data uh, very rigorously, and we're willing to admit where we're right and where we're wrong, uh, then the technology will get to a point where we're helping a good segment of people uh, in a very meaningful way. And unfortunately, there are plenty of folks who don't feel that way and feel like they can make a quick buck off of you today by calling something a stem cell, generally that they pull out of your arm or out of your fat, swirl it around in the air and then stick it back in you uh, and say that it'll cure what's, it cures what ails you. This has been around since the dawn of time um, and unfortunately, we're still susceptible to it because when we don't have other places to turn, we have a tendency to believe what people tell us. But again, your grandmother told you if it's too good to, to believe, it's probably not true. And that holds uh, uh, true for this as well. So it's great research. It's very promising research. It's moving. Um, but we also have to make sure that we, we 
do what's right, uh, that we're safe, um, and that we give you good information along the way. And that was what Gordon and Lulu founded the Foundation Fighting Blindness on, uh, was integrity and honesty um, as we walk with you through these, uh, these, these uh, uh, different diseases like retinitis pigmentosa and AMD. And with that, I'm, I thank you and I'm happy to answer any questions. Well, thank you, Dr. Gam, for that wonderful presentation and the technologies you're using, the scaffolding, that's, um, it's really fascinating, very cool stuff. The, the, the question out of the gate that I wanna ask, um, at least start with you, Dr. Gam, is especially the retinal patch that you're working on, who do you, which diseases do you think could potentially benefit from that approach um, when you're ready to uh, evaluate it in people? So, um, so first of all, it, you know, I think we, we have the same approach that a lot of folks do, which is you don't want to make things more complicated than you have to, right? So, um, so there are efforts in ours, including, uh, including ours, um, to replace the cells without having to have uh, a fancy scaffold around it, because that adds more uh, complexity. It adds um, biomaterials that have to de degrade, and the pathway to getting into patients is longer because of all those, those additional complexities that add on to it. So this really is more of a, uh, of a second generation or third generation. And so what we hope is that with the current therapies that are uh, more uh, based on just cell replacement, that we will see positive improvements um, as Dr. Young has mentioned, um, and that this will position us to um, uh, get even better responses um, by, um, by, by introducing some engineering with it. So that being said, uh, what types of diseases do we expect it to affect? Well, we can do photoreceptors only. So that would be for photoreceptor-based RP, um, uh, or we can do um, uh, diseases that affect both retinal pig pigment epithelium or RPE and photoreceptors. So Stargardt's, uh, dry age-related macular degeneration, things like that. Now, as it turns out, in a lot of patients with RP, their, their RPE, even though that's not where their genetic mutation is, is not all that healthy. And so it may be that having healthy RPE with photoreceptors is good for every, everybody. Well, not everybody, as you said before, it's not a silver bullet, but it may be good for folks who need just photoreceptors too. And that's something that needs to be evaluated. A downside of, of well, more than one downside of using a patch is A, it's a larger incision you have to make in the retina. So to get those bigger things in the subretinal space, you have to make a larger cut in the retina. And so that could impact safety. So far, that hasn't looked to be an, that much of an issue with some of the scaffolds that have been uh, implanted in patients with RPE only. The second is it kind of restricts the area that you can, that you can um, treat. So the size of your patch is, is the size, presumably, that will benefit if, if there is benefit from these scaffolds. You can put in more than one, perhaps, um, but it does make for a more complex surgery and perhaps a more limited area of treatment. So since you're delivering both RPE and photoreceptors, at least in the advanced version of what you're working on, that would potentially help people with macular conditions like Stargardt disease, dry AMD, uh, even best disease potentially? Yes. So because it's a limited area that you can treat, um, we, would, we would aim for macular-based disorders for that. Okay. Um, now, if you have, say, a, 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 don't want to get too far into the weeds, but some people have central vision loss where their RPE is pretty much okay. In those cases, you can also treat uh, the macula with, with photoreceptors only, potentially. Right, right. Okay, thanks. Yep. And I'd like to pose the same question to Dr. Ray about his approach, recognizing that you have a little ways to go before you're in a clinical trial. You mentioned regeneration potentially for people with RP. Do you think there are other retinal conditions for which that approach might apply? You know, really when I think about the, the people that we would be most, um, that it would be most um, amenable to their disease and really the first, first ones I'd, I'd like to see us try to, to repair, it would be trauma. Um, it would be, and I noticed one of the questions in the chat room had to do with trauma and, and retinal damage, retinal injury. 
One of the um, advantages of treating retinal injury is it's typically a rather acute disorder. Um, you get an injury and then the retina fails to repair or loses photoreceptors from a detachment or something like that. I think those are cases where you have a somewhat isolated retina condition. It leads to visual impairment. And by stimulating the glia to regenerate those neurons that were lost, um, you can then potentially improve the vision in people who've had retinal trauma or retinal injury from detachment or things like that. So I actually think that's, that's what we think in terms of the first targeting. Um, as, as David mentioned, you know, these, idea, these people where you still have RPE in the macula, but you've lost a lot of the cone vision there from cone degeneration. I think that would be a, another group that we could potentially look at very seriously for a, for trial. And, um, and then finally, I think, you know, with the advances in, in therapies, in, in gene therapies that are more, uh, that, that will address patients across the spectrum with RP, you know, and I know there's some work going on funded by the foundation to look at, at broader uh, applicability of gene therapies. I think that those, you know, any case where you can stop the ongoing degenerative process, but the vision is poor and potentially would want to restore some of the neurons that were lost, um, those things I think will ultimately be amenable to a regenerative approach as well. So I would see it as, as quite broad in terms of application, but probably trauma and the injury of, you know, acute loss of retinal cells would be someplace that I think we could, we could start with. Great, Th thanks for that, uh, that review of applications. Um, turning to uh, Dr. Young, we're getting a lot of questions about the J site and Reneuron trials. And one thing I wanted to just say before I start posing some of those questions to you, Dr. Young, you can all, for the participants, you can always go to clinicaltrials.gov to get a lot of the parameters, who's eligible, um, what the exclusion and inclusion criteria are, what sites are doing the trials and things like that. But one good question was about the redosing. And I think you mentioned in the J site trial, they needed to redose or potentially every year or something like that. Can you talk more about why that will need to be done? Well, I, I hope I didn't misspeak. I said that there is a potential for redosing. Okay. And that um, the cells can survive for up to a year. Okay. So one can expect that once those cells are gone, then the growth factors that they're delivering are gone as well. Okay, and so this is not, since this is not a transplant that is thought to integrate in the retina, meaning it's not gonna make connections, it's not gonna probably survive long-term in this micro environment of the vitreous, that it opens up the potential for redosing. And okay. that comes from the presentation that they made last year at the uh, retina specialist meeting um, in 2020. So I think the potential is there. The question is, is it necessary? And is it immunologically feasible? So the retina is an immune privileged site. And what that means is cells survive there better than they do in other non-privileged sites. And, and in some cases, the second exposure to a cell can give rise to a down regulation of the immune response. And in some cases, maybe in the degenerating retina, one becomes sensitized to the second exposure. And that might mean a rapid rejection of the second injection. So all of these things are best addressed in preclinical studies. And I believe those are being addressed. So I would say at present, we don't know whether a second dose is needed, necessary, or possible. So all of these things really need to be worked out. But I think um, because it is a growth factor mediated mechanism, if one expects to see prolonged neural protection, then a second dose, third dose, whatever, would need to be there for long-term protection. That's, that's just my 
my scientific opinion. Um, I don't represent j site or Reneuron, um, but I, I just have some, some experience in this area, and that will be my opinion. Okay, you, you certainly have experience in the area. And a similar question for the Reneuron approach is because the cells are being injected in the subretinal space with Reneuron, there's the hope that they'll actually integrate into the retina. Would that mean that redosing would hopefully be um, not needed for lack of a better way to put it? I would phrase it exactly that same way. That is the hope. Um, okay. Now the challenge with all of these therapies, um, stem cell transplantation in the eye full stop is that the cells that are transplanted are not labeled or findable in any meaningful way after transplantation. So thus far in you know, a dozen studies almost, I would say, transplanting retinal pigment epithelium, all we have is circumstantial evidence that the grafted cells persist. So the challenge with these studies is that if you're lucky, the cells disappear after transplantation. And by that, I mean, you don't see any untoward um, negative impact from the grafted cells. But thus far, I don't believe, and, and, and the other panelists can comment on that, please. Um, there's been no FDA approval for labeling the cells so that you can find them after transplantation. So everything, um, that's been reported in the scientific literature on prolonged survival of the cells is circumstantial and based on inferences from imaging studies. But there's really no way to find these cells after you put them in. This is not like a solid organ transplant where if you transplant a kidney, there's a kidney to be found after you transplant it. So right. this is a real challenge. And I think we're always weighing the safety benefits and risks of labeling cells with some of these novel, you know, iron particles, for instance, some of these new modalities of cell labeling that could be done um, with these first in man studies. So I think it's a real challenge to trace um, the fate of grafted cells in the eye. And I don't think we have a good answer for that yet. Thanks. Thanks for uh, addressing another challenging question. And I have one more for you, at least one more. So in both the j site and the Reneuron trials, I know they've enrolled people with various forms of RP. And I know there are people with Usher syndrome that have been in those trials as well, because at the end of the day, Usher syndrome is RP with hearing loss. Do you know if either trial is trying to connect the level of efficacy with a person's genetic profile at all? Um, I don't know that. Um, okay. I think it would make a great deal of sense since genotyping is so widely available um, to try to tease out responders versus non-responders, um, but I don't know if that's being done um, in a clinical setting as of yet, but it would make, a, it would make a, a really good amount of sense. Right, I'm sure they're looking at the levels of degeneration and at least looking at structurally who's benefiting more than um, perhaps other. Parts. Exactly, and I think they're moving more in that direction of trying to identify the two key components, structure and function, which I think are at least at least as important as, as mutation. Um, as, as I think has been mentioned by the two other panelists, um, there's a sweet spot for cell therapy for both a neuroprotective cell therapy, and that is photoreceptors have to remain, and for a cell replacement therapy, which um, has to occur before the mangled mess um, of disarray that Dr. Gam mentioned. Um, so there's, it's, I think most important in my opinion is structure and function in choosing patients that are most likely to benefit. Right, great, thanks again. So I wanna move 
back to another condition that we get questions about all the time, and that's LCA. And, and Dr. Gam, uh, since you're also a clinician, you see patients, I, I wanted to get your perspective. Obviously, LCA is just about the most severe form of retinal degeneration. And often when we talk about LCA, we're talking about gene therapies. Obviously, Luxterna is a big win, but there are other forms of LCA that might not be so amenable to gene therapies. And I realize this may not be such a fair question because LCA is very diverse in terms of how it affects the retina. But do you think, Dr. Gam, that some of these approaches, whether it's yours or perhaps a Reneuron approach, or even, well, I'll let Dr. Ray uh, talk about his own approach, but do you think some of these approaches might help people with LCA or at least some forms of LCA? Uh, yes, I think that um, LCA is, um, is uh, a term that is often used like retinitis pigmentosa. There's actually nothing different about LCA than RP, right? This, these, are, these are traditional terms that were used to bucket when we didn't know that, that what the genetic problems were. If you got LCA early and it was pretty severe, we called you labor congenital amaurosis after Dr. Labor. If you got it later in life and it was a little slower, we called you retinitis pigmentosa. Now we know that it's all about your gene. It's all about your gene. It's all about, this is for retina, this is for inherited disorders again. So I'm not talking about macular degeneration, things like that, that we also work with. So folks that have different diseases are like saying, well, they're not talking about me now. You realize that it's, you, we are dealing with all of them, but this particular topic, like you brought up was genetic diseases. So it matters, it matters what type you, of, 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 of genetic disorder you have and where you are. So what makes LCA in general different is it's more severe and it's earlier onset. That is important because in the general scheme of experimental therapies and clinical trials is you don't start with babies. You start with older individuals who can consent and so we can establish that there's safety. And if there, that safety is established, then you're allowed to move earlier and earlier um, uh, to younger patients like we saw with Lux Turner. Um, now with cell-based therapies, one of, the, one of the benefits is that it's agnostic towards your gene. So uh, a cell-based therapy does not care what gene went, went awry and, and what, how that caused you to lose vision. What it cares about is where are you on that spectrum of degeneration and what do you have left? Is there enough uh, of the retina to plug in those new cells that could potentially do that handshake and restore vision or not? Um, and are enough cells gone where it warrants trying to put in new cells as opposed to trying to protect the cells you already have or getting them to work better um, uh, by putting in a new gene. And I can't help it, I will go to my, my metaphor and that is if you have a house and the furnace goes, it's gonna hang around, it's still gonna be a house. It's gonna be perfectly fine. You can live there, you can have blankets. Um, and as long as you get a new furnace in, you, the house will work again. But if that house sits around for a long time with no furnace, and if it's in upper Midwest, people aren't gonna live there. They're not gonna take care of it. The house will, will crumble and go down. A new furnace that arrives on the front door, on, on the stoop is not gonna help you anymore. You need a new house. Um, so it matters where you are in that degenerative process to understand what types of therapies, just biologically, just common sense is gonna be able to help you. It's construction is what we're talking about. Um, and so that's important to understand when you're trying to make sense of all these different things. Um, where, where are they? Are they there to protect what you've got? Are they there to fix the genetic problem? And if you don't have a genetic problem, that's not gonna help you. So don't look to gene therapy if you've got, you know, uh, if you've had a retinal detachment because it's not a, you didn't, it wasn't because you have a genetic disorder. Um, or are you at a position where you need to replace the house? And what we can't do is replace the whole neighborhood. And that's the disarray. So some folks, the neighborhood is gone. You know, there's no power lines, there's nothing there. And you could just set up a house, but the house isn't gonna, can't do anything. You know, it's not connected to anything. And that's that extreme in position where, you know, we, that really isn't on the radar quite yet. And unfortunately, some folks are, are, are at that point. 
um, and would not be candidates for these types of therapies that we're talking about today. Okay, Th thanks for those wonderful analogies. I think most people can understand the house and the furnace and the neighborhood, so that's really great. And to close things out, I do wanna let Dr. Ray respond. I sort of alluded to him about LCA and maybe this is not fair at this juncture in your research, but do you think potentially your approach might help somebody with LCA or a very severe early onset retinal degeneration? Yeah, I think that um, I wanna echo David's, uh, Dr. Gam's comments. He. Um, you know, I think that what you have to always factor into this is that it's about stage of disease and about uh, and and how rapidly some of these diseases uh, progress. But having said that, LCA is a is I think a good candidate for cell replacement ultimately because it 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 progresses rapidly. And you know, a lot of times when people design clinical trials, they don't want to have to wait five years to get an answer on whether the therapy is working or not. And so LCA in some ways is, is amenable because of its rapid nature to having investors um, and biotechnology companies wanting to fund cl clinical trials for, for this approach, for these approaches. So I actually think that there's good potential uh, for LCA uh, being treated ultimately by cell replacement therapies. Great, well, th thanks for um, that comment. So we are approaching the top of the hour and we still have some closing remarks from our uh, national director of chapters, Renee Paulsell. But to um, close out at least my portion, I wanna thank Drs. Young, Ray and Gam for taking time out on a Saturday to educate our constituents. I wanna thank you personally for all the knowledge I've gained from you over the years and most important for this really incredible world-class research and work that you've all done that's moving um, out to the patients who need it. Um, it's really encouraging, it's incredible work and um, on behalf of our constituents, we can't thank you enough. So we appreciate that. So let me, um, load some slides here and hand it over to Renee Paul Self. Thank you so much, Ben. And again, I reiterate uh, Ben's comments that what a wonderful uh, presentation by our doctors today. Thank you so much for being with us. We appreciate your expertise and those questions that are still in the Q&A box, we will get your answers to you and we will follow up uh, to that. For those of you that are wondering, uh, this seminar webinar will be uh, recorded and the link to the presentation today will be sent out to you. So you will be getting that as a follow-up in the coming week. And we appreciate you being with us to really uh, showcase our new chapter branding and uh, what, uh, what wonderful future we have here at the Foundation Fighting Blindness. On the screen, there's a slide that describes our spring virtual vision walk. The vision walk slide is dark blue and to the uh, right on your screen or left on your screen is a picture of a lovely uh, family who has walked with us. Vision walk will be virtual again this year. We hope to be returning to in-person activities in the very near future, but this vision walk will be held on Saturday, June 12th, and the hashtag is Vision Walk Strong, and we hope that each one of you will be with us. Uh, we will be sending out a link so you can join us for our Vision Walk. All of the things that uh, we're able to do with this webinar and provide the wonderful research is, fun is using funds that are raised on this virtual Vision Walk and other special events that we do. So we really encourage you to get out, sign up, and be a part of our great um, program. We also have our next upcoming national chapter webinar, and the next national chapter webinar is a wonderful presentation on clinical trials. I know in the question and answer box, we had a number of questions about clinical trials, and so we have a wonderful panel group going to be speaking on May 22nd. Again, this will be at noon Eastern time, and those of you, again, that have registered are 
fortunate enough, we'll be sending out this link and we will be also uh, posting that on various sites so that you can share with your friends and family to join us for that next national chapter webinar. We really appreciate your presentation. And again, if you're interested in learning more about the future here at the Foundation Fighting Blindness, we encourage you to find a chapter near you. As you know, at the beginning of this, our uh, founder, uh, Mr. Gordon Gunn really gave us the, 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 the framework for what we're going to be doing moving forward. And we invite you to be uh, joining us and be a part of our future here at the Foundation Fighting Blindness. And the address on your website is fightingblindness.org slash chapters. We'd love to have you be a part of our organization in whatever corner of the United States or beyond that you're a part of. So thank you so much for being with us today and we wish you well and we look forward to you joining us again on May 22nd. Thanks again, Renee. And thanks again to all of you who attended. And one more thank you to our researchers and Martha Steele for uh, joining us today. H have a great rest of your day.